We are live in Milwaukee at Fiserv Forum, home of the Milwaukee Bucks, and we're really excited to be speaking with Dustin Godsey, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of the Milwaukee Bucks and Business Insider's 2022 Innovative CMO of the Year. Dustin, thanks so much for having us today, and I'm so excited for today's conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you coming in and experiencing here Fiserv Forum and the, the Bucks experience. Yeah, it's amazing to be here, and I'd love to start by just getting to know a little bit about you. I mean. Growing up, I could say one of my dream jobs would probably be the CMO of a National Basketball Association team. Here you are sitting here as a CMO. How did you end up here? And tell us about your journey. Yeah, so I mean, I grew up in the Midwest, grew up in Iowa. And, you know, I think up until probably the age of 12 or 14, my, my goal was to be in the NBA, but as a, as a player, which was very obvious. I was not going to be one of the Michael Jordan stories of How old were you when getting, you realized you weren't going to be able to make the NBA? I was very young. It was, <laughs> uh, I was not going to be one of those cut from your freshman year team and, right. and make it in stories like Michael Jordan. So I kind of went a, a different path, really, you know, went to school to be into journalism. Actually, my dream was to be on the sports reporters on ESPN, if you remember sure. remember that Jeremy show of oh, Jeremy Schapp and, and all that, and, you know, got through probably the first year of journalism school and realized that reporting was not what I wanted to do either and so I ended up you know going into marketing and, and got the journalism and marketing degrees and, and really happened upon the sports world I didn't even realize that that was a an opportunity to for a career happened into an internship in minor league baseball and, and have kind of stuck in the, the sports and entertainment world ever since so. very cool and, and back in 2012 you were actually the Milwaukee Bucks first marketing employee so you basically had a blank slate tell us about how that job was sort of painted to you and then when you came in, how did you kind of know what to do being the first employee? Yeah, no, I, it was, so I was in, in Philadelphia prior, kind of working on really more the arena side, shut down the spectrum, was part of the Wells Fargo Center, worked with the Sixers and the Flyers, but really had my, my goal at that point was to run a, t run a, a marketing department for a team. So specifically in the NBA, hopefully. So applied kind of on a whim in Milwaukee, had been in the city once in my life and came in and, and really, you know, as the position was, was kind of being positioned to me. You know, they're like, yeah, we've we've never had a marketing marketing department. We we it was a very small organization. I mean, I think we were at seventy total full time staff. Marketing was certainly happening, but it was you know each kind of department was doing their thing. Almost like an afterthought. Kind of an afterthought. Yeah. Kind of you know ticket sales did their thing. Our partnerships team did their own thing. There was no real brand cohesion. There was no real story, and that was kind of what the story was pitched to me. It was come in pull all these silos together and kind of to pull it down. So that was really where, where we started. That was under our, our previous ownership of, of Senator Cole. And the, the really interesting part was I, I got into town, you know, quit my job in Philly, moved back across the country, back to the Midwest. In the sort of two weeks interceding there, Commissioner Stern at the time had come to Milwaukee and said, if there's not a new arena or a, new, a plan for a new arena by 2017, we're not signing another lease, so wow. the, the bucks aren't going to be here. And we know, so you were on the clock. We were on the clock, and, and a lot of people, you know, in the market at the time, it was a it was a pretty distressed brand again because there was no real brand, there was no story behind it, and so you know the the community really basically told me. I mean, there were people to my face that would say, "Don't unpack your boxes," because you know it's going to be a, a pretty short trip here in, in Milwaukee. But you know, things have have certainly changed, and it, it's been a great opportunity to build from you know kind of marketing person number one into to this full team that, that encompasses, you know, a number of areas that I, at the time could have only kind of dreamed of being a part of. Right. So, I mean, you know, we're talking 2012 when you first joined. Here we are over 10 years later. The world has changed. You know, the world of digital obviously has taken over, especially when it comes to streaming and the NBA, yeah. et cetera. What are some of the main pillars that you've helped lay down here for the Milwaukee Bucks that you think have been so transformational in terms of the success of the Milwaukee Bucks brand? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really starts with, you know, 2014, the team was sold with new ownership coming in and, and Mark Lazary and, and Wes Seaton's new president, Peter Fagan. And, you know, our brand identity and what we've started to build really came from a really one of the first meetings that we had. The new owners brought in our the entire staff into, you know, this kind of small kitchen, kind of crowded everybody in. And I remember Wes said to, Everybody there was like, you know, we're here. We're here to win a championship. We're here to be a championship organization in the city of Milwaukee. If you don't believe that that's possible, that's fine. But you're probably not going to be a fit in our organization. And that really set the tone moving forward. And when you think about what we are as a brand, we are, 
we're a championship culture. That is first and foremost what we talk about. That's how we hire, who our internal team is. Often when, on the court. Often on the court. So we have great alignment with our, our team, with the, the basketball operations. We're, we're lucky to have a, a general manager and John Horst, who you know I kind of grew up with in the organization. So, so we know each other very well. They look for a certain type of championship player, the right kind of player that's going to go out and, and do the things that are committed to the city of Milwaukee and what this franchise wants to be. When we hire our staff, and you know that's the message that we put out to, to our fan base is, we don't want to do anything if we can't be the best at it. So you know there are going to be times where we're going to try things and, and fail, but we're going to keep trying. And, and you know we've been able to bring one one trophy in, and and hopefully we've got more of those to come. Yeah, and obviously you know having a beautiful arena here at the Pfizer Forum obviously doesn't hurt. So you have this great arena, you have a, a you know an incredible superstar in Giannis Antetokounmpo, who we'll talk about in a second, but. What are some of the tactics that you've used as CMO of an NBA team to build the brand? Yeah. Uh, what's been successful? Because ultimately, I would think your remit is ultimately selling tickets and selling merchandise. Is that what you're gauging uh, on th- for success? That's a big piece of it. Uh, you know, when you look, you know, directly at the the PNO, yeah, single game tickets sure. and, and retail and sponsorships, uh, sponsorships, all, yeah. all that kind of to falls under it. But I think you know, from my standpoint, where we've kind of built out this team, so. We have, we've kind of brought all of the areas that the brand touches under one roof. We used to be very disparate. Digital kind of reported into a different place. We had marketing, we had broadcast, we had our game entertainment, all kind of reporting different ways. So what we've done is we've brought that all together. So we have, you know, sort of our, our brand strategy pillar. We have our digital platforms. We also have our direct marketing, our database, our email, you know, all the personalization, all that. And then our, our game entertainment and our live events, and then we have our arena marketing team. So that that was kind of the first piece was bringing all those groups together. And now, as you mentioned, it was streaming and, and that sort of thing. Broadcast is now within that too. So really, everywhere our brand touches falls kind of within that roof. And so I think the the thing for us, and, and I think the thing when you you think about NBA teams and and what the role is is we have to super serve our our fan base here in Milwaukee, right? That's you know, a, most of our revenue is either coming from our, our media deals or our sponsorship deals or people coming in right. hyper localized. But when you look at our fan base and our audience, 75% of our social audience is global. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we have to we have to both super serve that local fan here, uh, have the world class experience, the you know, the sort of thing where we're we're blessed right now with a, a very good team, and and more often than not, fans are leaving happy because we won. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure that no matter what happens on the court, they're they're enjoying that experience and going through. But then we also take a, a lot of pride in a, a big piece of what we do is we're showcasing Milwaukee, not just the Bucks, but the city to the world. You you go a lot of places in the world, they don't know where Milwaukee is, but they know the Bucks, and they know Milwaukee is a, a piece of that. So a big piece of what we're doing is also telling the story of, of this community and, and our involvement in that. Yeah, and, and obviously you have to appeal to not only just fans around the world, but fans of all ages. Yeah. This younger fan base consumes content differently. Yeah. You know, they're on TikTok, they're about short form, they're about the highlights. Has that changed how you have to kind of story tell and bring new people into the franchise and get them interested? Oh, it absolutely has, and that, that's a big piece. And we, we often say, yes, we're a basketball team, but really we're, we're an entertainment, and we're, right. a, we're a content company, right? So, and when you, when you look at, and you, you hit on a good point, is, is outside of you know, maybe healthcare, we're one of the only industries that actually serves every generation, yeah. right? From, from kids who, Becoming fans to you know the the older fans who've been with us since the days of cream. I mean, it really runs the gamut. So, for us, like being able to to sort of you know turn on a dime, understand what's new coming through. We were the first team in, on TikTok. We were one of the first teams serving the the Chinese audience on Weibo. You know, really understanding those outlets and and where you can story tell differently, how you how you have to produce things differently for these different audiences to go through, is a big piece of what we do. And I think one of the challenges that comes one of the great things, but also one of the challenges that comes with that is we can only plan so much. You right. Know, we have a trade deadline in a couple of weeks. We have no idea what's going to happen and the entire narrative of the team could switch. So that's one of the things also is we have to know what's coming. We have to know what the audience are, but we also have to be nimble enough yeah. to be able to kind of change in stream as we go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously television is a huge part of the NBA ecosystem yeah. and the business model. Yeah. As the world changes, and I, I just we were just talking about CES, and one of the big themes there was about OTT yep. and how traditional linear television is now shifting and will be 
almost completely shifted in the next five to 10 years to streaming. How does that change, A, how you work with sponsors? Because I would imagine the beneficial part of that is they could be much more programmatic and targeted on yep. a local basis, but you can also still have global and national advertisers right. there. And also, does it impact the way that you kind of, uh, I guess, produce content over that channel? Yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. And I think even as the league has, you know, kind of broadened league pass and, and that sort of yeah. thing, we, you know, we get numbers now from all over the world. Right. So we know from a, a league pass standpoint who's watching our, our games. Who, we've even changed what we do in arena and, and sort of how we how we create that show because we know, you know, if someone's watching on League Pass in, in Paris, they don't see commercials, they see what's happening in our arena and what our experience exactly. is. So that we have to think even from that standpoint of, you know, every one of those touch pieces, which, you know, at one point may have just been like, let's let's run this funny skit or, or that sort of thing without context in the building. Now we know that that's being broadcast internationally. So you're involved in the on-court programming as well, whether it's halftime or in between timeouts, you're thinking about those as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of our, our kind of pillars on, on our team. We have a, a great team that does that, that's, you know, one of the best in the business, that it's, you know, completely integrated in with you know the storytelling that we're doing on social the storytelling we're doing on our TV broadcast you know want, we want those all to, to be aligned and, and similar and what about how do you know if you're doing a good job like is there interactions with your fans how are you listening to the fans whether it's within the arena or more broadly obviously they're yeah. going to talk about complaining about the game and there's only so much you can do about that right. much to the coach but how you kind of have that feedback loop open with your with your family yeah I mean that's one of the great things about the, this industry is is people care yeah and so when you're yes, doing do. something that they they don't like or you know less so when you when you do like it if you don't hear anything you, you generally feel like you're you're doing a pretty good job but it's we have a lot of mechanisms for getting that feedback it's you know we have a very robust analytics and and insights team that, that we work with internally that we're doing surveys after or every event you know we have regular touch bases with our fans where and you know it's social media it's a, a great world as well where Absolutely. we can get that sort of instant feedback from people and and really be able to, to kind of change our strategies in real time based on what we're seeing and what we're hearing from our yeah. fans which you, it's kind of a mandate right now yeah. for any brand. Any Absolutely. Other. So besides acquiring you in 2012, one of the best acquisitions Milwaukee Bucks ever had <laughs> was bringing on Giannis and the Kubo in 2013. I'd love to talk about him because he is such a force of nature, both off the court and on the court. He is a global phenomenon, yeah. and he obviously has a massive role in the recent success of the organization. Can you talk a little bit about how he has changed the culture throughout the organization and what benefits that gives you as a marketer to be able to do your job effectively. Yeah, no, I mean, the look, the great thing about Giannis, and, and really from the beginning when he came in, he was kind of an unknown quantity. Yeah, picked 11, 10 picked, other teams passed on him. Yeah, right? so, and comes in, had never really been in the United States before, had certainly never been to Milwaukee. But really right from the beginning, we saw, you know, this potential just from our personality of of him being willing to, to sort of tell his story and be out there authentically. Um, authentically. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I mean, we were right there in the car as he was out learning how to drive and, and those sorts wow. of things. So to, to be able to kind of be on this journey with him and, and go through has been incredible. And I think we saw that potential from the beginning and we were doing things, you know, Bill Simmons mentioned one time, like all he wanted was a Twitter account that told him when Giannis was going to get in the game so he could turn on League Pass yeah. and watch him. So we did that and, you know, created that because we sort of saw that like that myth making almost right from the beginning. But it wasn't a myth. It was really who this guy was. And I mean, his story is is incredible. So, you know, it's allowed us obviously to, you know, kind of put our our kind of global growth and what we want to do on a on a fast track because his while he's, you know, from Greece, has Nigerian roots, his story is, is kind of translatable in, in any language. People yeah. really understand what this is. And the great thing about him is he aligns so well. We don't have to try from our brand to align it to what Giannis is. He is this hardworking, all he cares about is being on the court, winning championships. And, and that's really, it was aligned with what our brand was and the story we were trying to tell. So it's been a perfect fit and, and you know, sort of lucky. You know, we don't, we don't often find ourselves in a role where, you know, the team and the, the superstar aligns so well with what totally. we say we are from a brand. So it's given us those opportunities to go out and, and, you know, certainly people say your job must be easy now. You know, you've got Giannis and you want a championship and, and in some ways it is, you know, selling tickets isn't, isn't a but challenge. There's a lot, but the but NBA there's a, is, has, has an embarrassment of riches in terms of the amount of young stars it absolutely. has right now. So there's so many other great stars uh, around the league yeah. as well that you have to compete for mind share with. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it almost becomes more challenging for it. We have to, you know, we're, we're still a, a very small team when you look at organizationally, the, the spotlight size, that's on me, yeah. market size and, and, you know, 
our entire department's about 40 people, all told when you, when you look at all these. So it, you know, we really have to focus on prioritizing what we're trying to accomplish and go through. And, you know, winning and having Giannis has, has brought, you know, kind of an embarrassment of, of partners wanting to work with us and, and other organizations wanting to kind of, we have to prioritize who fits with us, who, you know, aligns with our brand and, and choose our partners kind of wisely. So let's talk about that. So you have brand partners that want to partner with the Bucks in a variety of different ways, whether they want to have their billboard up in the arena or whether they want to do a promotion at halftime or they want to have the rights, rights to, yeah. you know, co-market with the brand. What is that process for how you evaluate brands? Do you have free reign? Is the league involved? Talk us kind of through that partnership dynamic. Yeah, I mean, the, the league's involved to a certain point in that we have certain assets that, you know, in arena side and that sort of thing that in a, a nationally televised game, they have the rights to that, right? right? So like if they have exclusivities with partners, we have to, to kind of go through that. But beyond that, it's every team is kind of on their own to, to go out really? and build this through. So obviously from a marketing side, we work very, very closely with our business development team that you know we're going out and, and when we talk about it, we don't say the word sponsor. You know, you're not buying ads They're with us. Basically. You're partnering, and and we Fiserv is a, a great example of our our naming rights partner here. It's a local company, you know, really aligned in in terms of of excellence and what they want to do and how they portray themselves with us, and that's what we like to go out and and you know kind of kind of work together with the the business development team and the marketing team on. We could partner or we could sell a lot of sponsorships, but what we want are our partners that you know, align with who we are culturally and who we are as a brand. Yeah. And then we build partnerships based on that. It's not about what you're going to get signage, you're going to get brand exposure in these different places, but it's, you know, how do we tell your story alongside of ours in a way that, that makes sense and is authentic for both of us. So I would imagine that's a big job of the marketing team is you understand your content calendar, the key pillars, the in arena experience, and then you'll take that and you'll overlay it with what a potential partner yeah. wants to do and you'll come back and work with your sales or business development team and say here's what we can do for yeah. you. And, and we really work with them from the beginning. We're involved in, in the pitches, we're involved in the meetings going out. We want to, you know, as any good sales team is going to do, you're going to listen to what the partner's trying to accomplish and, and put together a package based on that. But we, we don't want to do anything where it's cookie cutter, you know, we have this series, you know, let's do product placement or whatever, like we'll do some of that if it makes sense. But but we really want to work from them right from the beginning of, of them understanding what we're trying to accomplish with these things and how that can best align and accomplish their goals. So it's been a, a really fun process. And again, and that's where we look at our international audience and, and those sorts of things. We've got Motorola on our, on our jerseys, right? That, you know, they really look at us as this opportunity to, to be seen as a, a global brand and, and you know they've got goals in, in South America and other places where we've got big audiences and we can help kind of develop and, and build those plans over time as well. Yeah, I mean even the thought of having a corporate logo on a jersey 10 years ago or 15 years ago would have seemed foreign and now it's sort of commonplace. I know yeah. FIFA started to do it to begin with. So I imagine that part of what you're doing is part of your role is trying to figure out, I don't want to call it inventory, but just other opportunities where a brand can get more deeply integrated into the buck story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's for us, you know, when we when we look at what we're trying to do again, we want to be sort of on the, the front edge and the cutting edge on, on innovation and sure. what we do. You know, we look across the league and you, you mentioned it on on the jerseys and again, when I started, you know, it was only ten years ago, but you know, each team had two jerseys maybe a third. You know, when we went through our rebrand process in, in 2015, you know, we unveiled our alternate, you know, our alternate jersey. We then also said, how can we take this a step further? We built an entire new court to match that jersey. So that we were put, and being able to, again, kind of build those platforms to be able to go to a partner and say, at that point in time, you couldn't be on the jersey, but you know, you could tell the story of this this entire platform of, of our Fear the Deer Nights and, and what we're doing. So that's kind of where we think is constantly looking at, okay, like NBA sports in general can be a little bit cookie cutter and, you know, there's a lot of kind of stealing ideas from each other. Where can we find these these kind of unique areas to kind yeah. of own and, and take over? I can tell you by just being a fan, watching the NBA Finals a couple of years ago when you won against Phoenix, you could tell from the shots of the arena that the Bucks had a great story, that they had an incredible fan base, that they were in it. You could just tell, like, it was an exposure to the national sure audience and from the outside. Because you mentioned Fear the Deer, that was something yeah. you saw everywhere with people holding up the signs. It felt more like a, t like a mission, and the mission begins with the leadership, it begins with the story, and it's clear from the outside perspective that that work has been, was put in. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I think that will, you know, for us, 
again, that you sort of think the, the championship and the finals, like that moment where it's it's kind of the top of the mountain, but for us it was kind of the start of what we wanted to do yeah. and, and kind of the realization of some of the promises. But it was something that we always had an eye of, of what we're going to do and how we wanted that to look when we got there. And, and again, how we tell the story of Milwaukee and and we really saw ourselves as this this brand that was sort of aligned with our city of, you know, kind of once proud, you know, kind of this championship. Milwaukee was, you know, one of the top 10 markets in, in the United States a little bit of a decline and now kind of back up on the upswing through this younger generation, through innovation, through that sort of thing. And so for us to have that moment that was kind of this, you know, $2 billion commercial for the city of Milwaukee was was really incredible to, to be able to be a part of. Absolutely. So it's a cold winter day today here in Milwaukee. We're in the heart of the season here in early 2023. You know, you talked about innovation. What are some of the things that uh, the fans can expect to see from the Bucks from a marketing perspective this year that maybe they haven't in the past. I know the app has been one thing you really yeah. focused on building out. So let's talk about the app and maybe some other things that you have your eye on. Yeah, I think when you look at you know how we keep an eye on this, it's it's thinking about that holistic 360 journey of, of our fan and, and knowing that that is completely different because we have, again, that, that super cert fan who are the ones who are here at every game the season ticket holder going through to, you know, the ones who maybe are in Greece and are, are waking up really early in the, in the right. morning to be able to watch Giannis. The, the app, the mobile app has really become our, our sort of one, one source of truth and, and where we want the experience, whether you're watching content, whether you're watching our press conferences, our, our interviews, you know, our, our behind the scenes, you know, kind of restricted area content pieces within the app. Or if you're coming into the building, that's where you're managing your tickets. That's where you're going to order your food and beverage so you can sit right in your seat and not miss you know, the t-shirt the cans as they're coming out, put in your order and go through. And then for us, it, it became, becomes obviously from a marketing standpoint, our area of, of data collection, understanding really who's in the building. And I think that's been a, a giant change over the last few years is, is really getting from a, a point where you, know, you had one person who bought four tickets you have no idea who those other three people are. Right. To us now trying to connect the dots and then when you talk getting about that first party data, getting that first party data is, and, and understanding who it is. And then, you know, when you look at Deer District and we have, you know, ten thousand people out watching a game, we have no idea who those people are. So how we start to bring those technologies together to connect that, work with our our analytics and our insights team to really understand, you know, maybe this isn't a season ticket buyer. But they're probably a, a Jersey buyer, or you know, they're going to go to our bar and restaurant across the street. And how do we connect all those dots? So that's a big piece for us is continuing on that technology side. Another piece is, is you talk about retail and brand and, and how we're trying to you know continue to engage our, our global audiences and and maybe fans who wouldn't who don't necessarily care as much about the storytelling on the basketball side is we're in the process of launching our private label retail line. So, you know, obviously all the teams work with the Mitchell and Nesses and the New Eras and Nike obviously is a, a major one. What we're doing is we're creating a, a more of a lifestyle and culture brand that will allow us to tell our brand story even more, wow. tell that Milwaukee story. You know, we've got we're gonna we've got kind of three pillars of it that we're gonna do. One is again sort of this lifestyle kind of uh, working with some licensees that we're gonna be able to sell on our pro shop and, and go out. And then we're gonna work with and we've got three lined up right now of of collaborators that are either local artists or kind of international brands or you know we're working with Brandon Jennings who, you know, when you talk about Bucks and Six Lore, he's actually the one who first said Bucks and Six kind of in jest about it was my first season, uh, we were playing the Heat. And they had, somebody asked him, you know, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade Heat, you know, who's going to win the series? And he said, well, Bucks and Six. And it became sort of the, this myth and, and a little bit, you know, sort of we obviously got swept and, and went out. But as we went through and then we won the finals in six games. Right. And so it became this sort of full circle thing. So we said, you know, this is really part of, of our culture and who we are. Uh, so we're going to build this out. And like I said, so we're going to uh, do a capsule with him. We've got a line with a local uh, artist who's actually a Sudanese refugee who moved to Milwaukee when he was 13 and has now created his own lifestyle brand. So we're going to help him kind of tell that story. And then another brand that, that Chris Middleton has you know has worn and is is friends with and has connections with, so really doing this to extend the brand, you know, culture and, and fashion has been be, and, beyond right. just jerseys and, and logos slapped on things. You know, it's fashion and, and culture has become so much of what the NBA is, and you know the the awareness and people wanting to see what guys are wearing into the the arena. We want to create something that players for other teams would want to wear when cool. when they're walking in. That's so. very cool. Yeah, and you talk about seeding the brand into, into culture and, and making sure it's, it, you're, you're kind of expanding the story of the Bucks right. beyond just being a, a team with five guys on a court. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right. And, and that goes back to, you know, when we did the rebrand, we, you know, 
most teams work with kind of the same two or three agencies that do a lot of the logos and, and there was never really much storytelling even behind that. We went out, we found this, you know, streetwear, really cool small boutique agency in Brooklyn that helped us kind of build this out and they'd worked with Nike, they'd done this, so we really went into it intentionally around we want to create things that Yes, we're going to have fans who root for our logo no matter what it is, just because the players are on. But we also want to create something that, that throughout the world people are yeah, going to wear and growth. be a part of and, and drive that growth. Absolutely. So as we wrap up here, Dustin, um, you know, as I mentioned at the onset of this interview, you, know, you have a very cool role, and it's even more cool now after hearing all the different uh, components of it. If you were to give one of our younger listeners here at the Speed of Culture podcast advice on the steps they need to take early in their career to one day maybe end up in such a prolific seat, yeah. what advice would you give them? No, I, I mean, I think one of the big pieces that, I mean, obviously networking and understanding and sort of collecting people, right, and, and understanding, yeah. you know, who's out there and, and always taking those opportunities to get to know people and you never know when that's going to come back around. But I think for me, one of the things that, that was kind of big in my career was not saying no to opportunities, mm -hmm. right? I remember my first, my first full-time job, I went in, it was with a, a junior hockey team they offered me a, a position kind of on the spot. They're like, we need somebody. The season starts in a couple of weeks. Salary's going to be commission only. I was like, well, I'm not really sell Like, I'm the PR guy and the marketing guy. Like, what am I selling? And they're like, well, you'll sell in the off season. I was like, I'm not sure that works for me. But like, they're like, ah, come back tomorrow and we'll figure it out. So I came back the next day. We figured it out. And, and it was kind of the stepping stone of the rest. I moved into, you know, kind of more arena, outside of sports into more arena marketing, entertainment marketing. You know, promoting the circus, promoting Disney on Ice, which again was not on my career bucket list of things to do, but I learned so much from those opportunities. So, you know, I think that's what the big thing is always kind of understand that those opportunities that come around may not fit exactly. You know, don't plan out your five years. You, you may have your goals and that's great, but really, you know, anything you can learn from any of those opportunities is going to help you as you go, go down your path. Absolutely. absolutely. Is, is there kind of one mantra on that that you? kind of like to live by, that you wake up every day? And yeah, I mean, I, I actually, you know, on my wall in my office behind me, I've got a, a framed piece from a, an artist named Mike Montero, who's a graphic designer, that says, let's make better mistakes tomorrow. And to me, that's kind of the, for especially in our business and what we do, but I think it, it kind of applies to everything. Absolutely. Is, is fail, fail fast, learn from it, and, and move on. We're all, you know, fallible humans. 100%. And everything's going to be, you know, even if it, something works, there's going to be mistakes made along the line. Let's learn from it and, and build from it. Yeah, as you what go. do they tell players in the court if they miss their first eight shots? Take the ninth. Take the ninth. If you're a yep. shooter, keep going, Absolutely. and eventually they'll start going through the net. And, you know, it seems like a lot's been going through the net. Uh, for you here at the Bucks. So congratulations on your success. Sure. Uh, on behalf of Susie and Adwee team, special thanks once again to Dustin Godsey, Chief Marketing Officer of the Milwaukee Bucks for joining us. We are here at, in Milwaukee at the Pfizer Forum with the world champion Milwaukee Bucks and uh, really excited to be here. I'm really excited for our audience to hear today's podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And thanks again for joining. See you soon, everyone. Take care.